here from Johns Hopkins. Um, much of this is due to COVID, has really kind of upended our lives, needless to tell you, um, and certainly kind of shifted how college admissions works in some ways. Um, and one of those ways is certainly testing. So there are um, a lot of changes coming, <coughs> changes that have been going on since um, 2020. Um, we are very fortunate to um, have this partnership with Capital Educators. Um, I always say great college counseling is about collaboration, collaborating with you, collaborating with kids, collaborating with our faculty and our partners in the admissions world and testing world. Um, and uh, Phil is one of those great collaborate, collaborators that we've been working with for quite a while now. Um, he is the president and co-founder of Capital Educators. He's a graduate of Princeton University. Um, when he was at Princeton, he tutored kids in the SAT, right, Phil? Um, and following that, went to work at Princeton High School, Dalton School in New York City. I know this right part, that's how long it's been. I don't know why I brought the paper. Um, he has um, taken the SAT many, many times, something I, I, much as I love our students, something you will never find me doing. Um, <laughs> I know there's some counselors who've done that. Um, and spent really thousands of hours um, researching um, testing um, procedures, uh, building curriculum, <clears throat> curricula, and he's even published a book on the SAT. Um, he trains every cap ed instructor, and he's, he's by now helps hundreds of people navigate the application and testing process. Um, he also is very dedicated to helping underserved students um, receive inexpensive test prep by providing financial aid and running pro bono programs. He sits on the advisory board, or do you still, maybe this is a National Scholar Program and Bridges at St. Paul's? Yep. Okay, because this is from maybe from before. Um, so we're really fortunate to have him here with us um, this morning. Thank you for join, driving up from DC, and um, thank you all for coming. And I'll turn it over to you. All right, great, thank you. E every year I hope that you'll get through that bio a little quicker than you do. <laughs> Um, again, I'm, I'm Phil Pine. I, I run Capital Educators. I, I spend most of my time helping juniors prepare for these tests. Um, but I also do like to get around in the second semester of 10th grade because I know that this is when the questions start to pop up and when you're all starting to think about the timeline for, for testing. So here's where I thought I'd start with you. All right, I'm going to pull up a sample question that I stole from an old SAT. This may bring back some painful and unpleasant <laughs> memories. Um, I will give you a tiny bit of background. This question was one that I took from the back end of an exam. And because it was placed late in the test, that means it was meant to be difficult. And it was a question that 90% of the country answered incorrectly when it was first administered. So no pressure, but here it is, all right? So this guy, Vicken, he drove to work at an average speed of 40 kilometers per hour and returned along the same route at 60 kilometers per hour. What was his average speed in kilometers per hour for the round trip? I can already see the glazed, the glazed looks. Um, let me ask you this. Where do you think most 16 and 17 year old eyes are gonna gravitate really quickly? What's the choice everyone is gonna pick? 50, okay? And maybe I shouldn't limit that to adolescent ages. Like, okay, this is the choice we all wanna pick. Um, but I gave you a warning. I mentioned that this was found near the end of the test. And so one of the first instincts we try to beat out of students who are working on this is what we call the joke lies instinct, and that is, not picking the obvious answer on questions that are designed to be difficult. So we'll tell the guys, like, you're allowed to get this wrong, but you're totally not allowed to get it wrong by picking 50. Like, <laughs> get it wrong another way. Because 50 is just jumping off the page. It's too easy to arrive at that answer. Um, see if anybody here has a sense for this Joe Bloggs character. If you don't pick 50, <laughs> but you still have his inspiration sort of pumping through your veins. What's the next choice he probably picks? The lazy choice. Worse than that. It can't be determined. I think that's the next place Joe goes. 
Mostly because he's saying, you know what, it's too hard. It cannot be done. Um, if you want to impart one bit of testing knowledge to your sophomores, you can tell them it can't be determined. It's never going to be right near the end of an exam because if they bother to frame a question, it will have a numerical answer. Now we're in pretty good shape. Like on the surface, it's a 50-50 call, but honestly, even if it's been 30 years since you've taken a math class, I think we probably can agree one choice makes no sense. What's the bad choice? 40 makes no sense. Because the average has to be somewhere between the 40 and the 60. We pick 48, we collect our 10 points, um, and more importantly, we pick up 10 points we're not supposed to get. And those are particularly valuable as someone who coaches students on this. Um, I won't do the math, but I will explain it, if that's okay. Are we interested? So this guy drives to work at an average speed of 40. And what's his speed going back? 60. Okay, I'm acting it out. So at what speed is this guy spending more time in the car? I heard it. The 40, right? And that's kind of the essence of the question. Since he spends more time at the slow speed, what will that do to his average? It's going to drop it. It's not going to depress it a lot. It's just going to drop it enough to cause testing pain, right? To make this question difficult. All right. I promise we will do, not do any more math today. <laughs> but I did want to show you a sample question for a few reasons. The, the first is, I did want to mention the fact that like these tests are still tricky. Right Now the good news is, they're actually less tricky than they were 30-ish years ago when we all took this thing in high school, okay? There's a little less geoblogs now than there was back in the 80s and 90s, so that's good. Second thing I would point out is, do you see any advanced mathematics going on here? Is there any like pre-calculus? No. No. That's another important point. These exams are not intended to test the most sophisticated content that kids see in high school because they don't want it to be an exam that is pitting Gilman against other schools across the country. Um, they want it to be really covering material that's more foundational. Eighth, ninth, maybe tenth grade content that basically everyone should have had by the time they sit for these things. Third point I think is I stole this question from an old SAT, right? Um, but this question would be just as likely to be on the PSAT, just as likely to be on the upcoming digital version of the SAT, which we'll totally talk about. Um, and it would actually be more likely to be on the ACT. And I guess my, my big point here is that all of these different instruments test very similar content, okay? And so, becoming a stronger tester can really help you on any one of those different exams that the guys are contemplating. All right, and that kind of leads me to my next multiple choice question, which is, which test am I supposed to take, okay? And as you all know, this year that question is made a touch more complicated because of the upcoming transition to digital testing. One answer choice I want to try to eliminate collectively, and I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but choice E is not really an option, okay? I, the guys are going to talk about test optional. You've all heard about test optional. I want to talk for a second about, about that because I think it's important to sort of understand where things are big picture, right? So if you've been following along at all, um, you know that Students right now, kids in the class of 2023, the students who've gotten their college um, acceptances at this point, were really able to apply almost anywhere they wanted this year, okay, with or without a score, okay? Um, I use the word almost because there are a handful of places that require testing of all their applicants. If you look on the screens, you'll see these are primarily larger southern state school institutions, um, service academies, a couple of private colleges. And it's dangerous to get into like big time predictions. Things change so quickly now. Um, but if you ask most college counselors and people in testing, we would expect 
that test required column to gradually grow over the next couple of years. But we also expect the essence of the system to remain intact. Meaning in 16 to 18 months when you all are dealing with this, there, there's a great chance that many, many schools on your son's list will be test optional. Okay. Now, the reason why we don't expect dramatic change, okay, is that pretty much everyone benefits from the current system. Um, on the college side, as you might imagine, the second that these schools went test optional, and many of them, as you know, made this transition in like <laughs> the spring of 2020, for obvious reasons, okay, those schools immediately get way more applications, right? Why is that? Yeah, more people feel much more emboldened, okay, to apply more places. There's a lot less fear as part of the equation. The second thing that happens, and this has caused some angst among families that are looking into this, is that the incoming average scores that colleges are reporting have gone up between somewhat and considerably. And that's because there's self-selection at play, right? I mean, who's sending their scores in? People who did well. They're, they're, okay, so the students who, who want to showcase their numbers are like, here, look at me. And literally every year you, you check the numbers out, they become a little more intimidating. Okay? Um, but again, keep in mind, that doesn't mean those numbers capture everyone who's at those, on those campuses. Okay, so from the college's vantage point, more applications, lower acceptance rates, right? higher scores, maybe a higher ranking. There's like a lot of fuel behind this. And they make this change all while pursuing something that is truly amiable and admirable, and that is providing better access and equity, okay? Specifically to populations of students from underserved areas and from weaker school systems and districts. So a lot of reasons to, for things to sort of stay where they are. Maybe this part is not like why you came out this morning, um, but here's, here's maybe a half that's a little more relevant immediately. Test optional helps our kids. For starters, it really does widen the path of admission, okay, at some schools. And there will be some schools on your son's list down the road that might not have been there six or seven years ago because you would have looked and been like, okay, no, the, like, the scores are too high, this is numerically prohibitive. So that's awesome. But the way, way bigger piece here is the second bullet, okay? Um, test optional admissions puts more control in your applicant's hands and in your hands as a family. Because here's what we want you to do, it's not that complicated. We want the guys to think about testing and plan for it, and in most cases prep for it, and certainly to take the exam. Then, by the time you get to the fall of senior year, you're gonna sit down with the college counselors and the guys are gonna figure out what to do with those scores, okay? In some of their cases, if the numbers are high enough, they will send their scores to every college on their list, okay? They'll be this person, okay? In some cases, it's conceivable your son may be in the opposite camp where the grades are here, the scores are here, and there may be an argument for your son to shield their scores from, from all the colleges he's considering. And I don't know, I don't, want to, I don't want to speak for you all, but I think what's become increasingly common is that many of the guys are like somewhere in the middle where they send their scores off to places where we think they'll help, and they shield the scores from places where we don't. Right? And that's a case-by-case, school-by-school, very individualized you know, decision. But the only way to have those choices is for the poor guys to test. So <laughs> don't, don't let them push choice E on you here. Um, they're probably in for some testing. And the way I think of it, you know, we use the expression test optional. I think of it more as send optional now, um, because that's really where, where the control is and where the any, any questions so far? You've gotten very quiet. I feel like I've only, I've only increased the agita here. Okay, let's see if I can take it down a notch. Um, 
Oh, I want to do one thing. This is a slide I put together. I think we shared this last year virtually. I, I took a look at um, University of Maryland College Park for the obvious reason that like that's a, you know the most popular school in our area. And what I saw was that the average incoming reported scores for freshmen was 1380, okay? Or on the ACT scale, 31 out of 36. <coughs> Um, by the way, let's start with 1380. How many of you, just out of curiosity, are from this area or close originally? Okay, so 1380 in Maryland may not be like in your memory from when we were growing up here. Um, SAT scores have been inflated many, many times over over the last several decades. Okay, and that 1380 is a function of test optional. So there are a lot of things at play here, making the number look scarier than you. But here's the kind of exercise a student might go through in 12th grade based on scores. All right? Okay. Here's our first candidate. Here's someone who earned a 1440 on the SAT. Maybe in his first sitting, maybe it took two sittings, doesn't matter, but ultimately those were his official scores. Okay? He's almost certainly going to send them, right? Okay, his scores are flirting with the 75th percentile of what Maryland expects to see. Those scores may be high enough, along with good grades, to provide some fuel to get him into a scholars or an honors program. Not a tough call. Okay. Here's our second student. Okay. Who's he after? 1230? Okay. So, 1230 is a very good score, okay? Nationally, it's way, way, way above average, and it's a score that this student would use at a lot of places. But if this candidate is serious about College Park, he's probably going to shield that number, right? Because it's coming in about 150 points below the school's average. All right, and there's our third candidate somewhere in the middle. What do you guys think? Just curious. I got a quick no. Any yeses? Any yes people? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. All right, I got, I got a yes. All right. And I've got like 28 abstaining. Okay, now we got another. There's, there's, no right, there's no right answer here. I didn't just set it up that way. The student's considering it. Eight or nine times out of ten, we would we would typically recommend that this student share the score. Okay, of course it's not exactly perfectly at the school's average, but it is solidly within the average range of what College Park expects to see. It's a piece of data that is corroborative. It communicates to the school that the student can can do the work there, um, but. I say eight or nine out of 10, and I say probably because this is just the first step in figuring things out. Before you ultimately pull the trigger and send or shield scores, you absolutely need to talk to the counselors because they have the hyper-local information, like how Gilman guys do with these scores, and they also can look at your 1350 compared to your transcript, and you can figure out whether those numbers go really well together or or they don't. But if you want to very quietly in the background get a feel for this, you can pull up the average SAT scores at any school in the country within seconds. Almost as quickly, you'll be able to find the, the 25th and 75th percentiles. And if your son's scores are solidly within that middle range, there's a good chance those scores are going to be usable. And that we're going to recommend that they, that they share them. Please. What percent of people in New York and College Park actually submit their scores? Yeah, so this varies quite a bit from school to school. Um, I don't know offhand like the exact percentage of College Park, but I would imagine it's closer to 50 or 60 percent. Um, Sarah, you may have a, a better feel for this. That's sort of what I'm thinking, like 60, 40 or 50, 50. Um, I think that's what Ken told us. 
Yeah. And, and so it's a, it's a sliding scale. The short of it's not really that, people get really hyped up here. Here's, here's, the, here's the message. If, if you have a score that we think is usable, right, that falls into a reasonable range, all things being equal, it's to your son's advantage to share it. Okay, that extra data point can absolutely confer an advantage. But if your son has his heart set on a school for which his numbers are, are low, then there's nothing to talk about. Then you, sh you shield the score and you apply and you use all the other elements to hopefully get in. Okay? But the only way to get to this place is to have numbers bank in your pocket. So your statement that uh, you send to your little needle uh, will benefit the applicant, is that anecdotal or is fact-based? For example, it's like you can, you know, you're between 25 to 50 percentile two applicants, everything else is the same. Are you saying that based on the fact that sharing will get you one step up or doesn't matter, um, indifferent from an admission office, officer's perspective? I think if you have two applicants with similar with similar elements, and by the way, no two applicants are the same. I mean, it's yeah. possible to say that, but I think if you have two candidates and one of them shares a score that is solidly within the school's range and another student withholds the score, that the former student does have an advantage. It's going to be greater at some schools than others, but when you look at the data, students with numbers typically fare a little bit better than students without. Um, what's complicated though is, as you might imagine, the students with scores are often also savvier <laughs> applicants, right? They usually study for these tests, they usually have strong grades, they usually have all the other pieces in place. Um, another question is, if you have SAT score high, GPA like 50% high, <laughs> versus the other way around, okay, then which one is better? That's a great one. That's a great question. You guys catch that? So would you rather have super high scores and more middling grades or the reverse? I'm going to turn it to you and see what you guys think, and then I'll give you my, my answer. What would you rather have, a high score or a high GPA? High GPA. High GPA. Because the, the, your grades and your transcript reflect four years of work here at Gilman. Um, and so if it's a black and white choice, um, it's absolutely preferable to have that strong high school record. Um, you know, the, the, the concern the other way is that you might be presenting as an, as an underachiever. And um, while there may be some schools out there that say, wow, look at those scores and the potential of this student, I, I would much rather be the candidate with the higher grades. Um, and I say this as someone who lives testing, okay? I only do testing. I have no other outside hobbies or interests. Okay? Like, <laughs> you're like, you're laughing, but it's, it's, it's become true. So Sarah was nice when she said I've taken the test many times. Many is a, nice, a euphemism for what I've done. Um, so I believe in testing, but I do not believe that it is more important than your, your high school experience, not even close. All right, so let's revisit this question. We've gotten rid of choice E, okay? And mostly now we're staring at these three other different testing options. And the reason we have the conversation at all is, okay, colleges are 100% equally happy nowadays to get any of these official scores from an applicant, okay? The paper SAT, the ACT, or what will be the digital SAT. Frankly, at a period of test optional admissions when there are fewer scores in circulation, they're gonna be excited to get any, any number your son is willing to share. So as you navigate this decision, you really should not be worried about what the college wants. It's all a question of what's gonna really work for your son, his schedule, as well as his, his testing temperament. Um, I think in order to answer A, B, C, D, we need to kind of talk about the next year and how testing is gonna be organized. So, let's do that. So here's, here's our timeline, okay? The paper and pencil SAT 
okay, the tried and true exam that has been around since 1926, all right, um, is going to be retired at the end of 2023. Uh, I know that sounds dramatic. The reality is the SAT changes almost every 10 years, and it has since I've gotten into this field. As a matter of fact, the digital test will be the fifth version of the SAT I've, I've tutored, okay? That's how often this stuff changes. But this transition is obviously a significant one, all right? Given the way things line up, applicants basically have three ways to play it. And this, by applicants, I mean your kids, okay? One group of students, a good number, will do their preparation this summer, at least get started with it, and at the end of that preparation say, you know what, I've been studying, I should test. And they'll sit for a paper SAT. And if you look, you'll see that there are four opportunities the guys will have to take this exam between August and December. And you probably recently got an announcement about the course I'm running at Gilman this summer, that course is going to be specifically designed to have them ready to take these tests. And we were talking about this earlier. If your son is gonna take the summer course with us, which we'd love to have him, okay? We pretty much insist <laughs> that he take an official exam in the early fall while all that learning is fresh so that we can make intelligent decisions about what comes next, okay? Second choice you can make is Students can forego the paper test completely. They can plan to do their test preparation later in the year, say next winter, and they can test starting in March in a, in a digital way, okay, where the test will be administered on computer, and I'll be talking about that. Third choice out there is you can completely forego this entire transition thing, and what test can your son take? The ACT which is also in paper and also not changing, okay? The reality is, and I, I don't want to depress you with this, but many of your guys will end up probably taking two types of tests in the coming year, okay? Maybe it will be the paper SAT and ACT. Maybe it will be the paper SAT and then a digital SAT later on. Because these exams are not written in different languages, because they're all pretty darn similar, Okay, becoming a stronger tester will help them on any number of these platforms. And the bigger picture is this, there's really nothing to lose by taking two, two types of tests because what can you do if it doesn't go well? You can, see, this is a parent answer. I gotta take it again. The student answer is gonna be what? I can shield it and no one needs to know I took it. Both things are true. So there's not a lot to lose. I don't recommend over-testing, um, but I do think it's just smart for you all to know that like, there are a number of permutations, a number of ways this can play out. Um, but I do think, again, if your son's gonna get started this summer, and we've, we've really tried to push the summer prep because we know how much more time the guys have, then their first experience should be a paper test, either SAT or ACT in the fall, okay? Please. Um, you said that the SAT, ACT is very similar. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, why would an applicant take both instead of focusing on one? Well, what we're generally seeing is we want students to have a primary test. We want them to focus on one. But even if they focus on one, even if your son works this summer and is purely targeting that August SAT, in the back of our minds, I want them to be open to the possibility that I may try a paper ACT at some point, or I may end up taking a digital SAT later in the year. But I'm with you. The goal is to sort of pick your poison up front, but to maintain an open mind throughout, because we have a backup, which is really nice. That was not the case years ago. And you mentioned that, so the fall PSAT will be digital, and Phil will also offer the, the juniors a chance to do a mock ACT or a practice ACT in November next year. So that could be another way to try and determine. Yes. And by the way, even if your son's work, work this summer in preparation for paper SAT testing, we'll also give them a chance to try a practice digital test with us before the PSAT. 
So we're going to expose them so that they can get a handle on the different options. Um, just one very big thing about this. Right? That's fine. The if SAPs, ACPs are so similar, but truly, like, what are the differences? Like, why would you choose? Totally going there. That's a check. I'm, that's that's <laughs> next. You're setting me up. What was the other question? Uh, was, I know we don't have the data about the digital, but given like how much on digital they are and whatnot, based on what you know and what you know of students, do you anticipate these scores changing simply because of being digital or not? Okay, great. So the second question I'll take on: How will a new platform change scores? Okay. This is something College Board is working really rigorously on right now. The idea is that digital and paper scores should perfectly equate. That a 1260 earned on paper this August is meant to be equivalent to a 1260 they earn in March, okay? In, ter in terms of content. Now, could a student feel more comfortable in one setting versus another? And, and might that play out? Sure. But that's an important goal for College Board because they also want colleges to be able to make sense of the scores. So this is not a point in time when they're playing with scoring tables. All right. Oh, here we go. Sorry. So with the digital SAP, I've heard that the way College Board is doing it and they're making coding harder and harder as you answer Yes, I'm coming. I'm going there right now. <laughs> well, so I have two questions. Okay. Um, I don't remember how this goes, but I'm just a little bit confused. Um, when you send your, if you choose to send your scores and you take them multiple times, does it send all of your scores or just your best ones? Okay, you're going to, as an applicant, you're going to decide to send a day's worth of scores or not. So you could send one day, one sitting or two sittings, depending on how you did. Okay. There are a couple of colleges that will ask you to send all, but they are few and far between. Basically, it's going to be a day-by-day -day decision. Okay, and then the second question is, if, do you know if there will be practice digital SATs for the kids before they go sit for the first one? There are already four sample practice digital tests released by the College Board. Um, that's, that's what I'm spending all my free time doing, is developing hours. We're already administering practice digital tests. And we will have that available for the guys next fall, if they're interested, before they, they even try a digital PSAT. So there, they, there will be material, yeah. I'm absolutely coming to your question. I'm not ignoring you, okay. So let's talk about the digital a second, just so you can understand how things are evolving. For, for starters, even though the test is going on computer, the guys are not going to be able to take the test in their pajamas at home any day of the week whenever they feel like it. Um, the, you're laughing, but like this, this is where the testing is probably going in a handful of years, but we're not there yet. Um, they're going to still report to testing centers on Saturday mornings, but in advance of that, they're going to need to download the College Board app and they're gonna, and when they do, they'll get an encrypted copy of the test, which they will open when they, when they come in on that Saturday to start testing, okay? They'll be able to take the exam on a laptop or um, on a tablet, provided it, can meet, it meets the specs and is, allows for the download that I mentioned earlier. Another change that the test is gonna be considerably shorter, and, and that gets to what you were describing here. So, Here's how the digital test works. Rather than, like, the way the exams work now is you put 20 people in a room and every student has the exact same test booklet, essentially. They all do the same questions at the same time. And that's what we call a static exam, an unchanging exam. The digital test is going to be dynamic, or to use the word that they use in testing, adaptive. Okay? So what that means is how you do early on will affect your experience later, okay? The questions you see earlier affect the questions you see later. Now, I don't know, anyone in here take, ever take a digital exam for graduate school? Do you get GMAT or GRE or something else? Yeah, so 
A lot of the digital tests that have been out there at the graduate level have been question by question adaptive, meaning you get number one right and number two is harder. You get number two right and number three is harder. This is actually not that way. This is more section by section adaptive. So for example, your, your son might go in and his first section or module will be 22 questions of math. And those math questions will be predominantly of medium or moderate difficulty, right? If he does fairly well on that first module, he'll be routed to a second, more difficult module, okay, which contains harder questions. And if he has more trouble up front, he'll be routed to a second module of slightly less difficulty, okay? And based on his performance on both sections worth of questions will generate a score out of 800 points on the familiar scale, okay? Because of that routing, the test gets shorter. Because if your son is a pretty strong math student, okay, if he lands in that second harder module, he's not gonna be exposed to like an hour's worth of relatively easy content he would normally get right, if that makes sense. And if you're someone for whom testing comes a little less naturally, if you land in the slightly easier second module, the opposite is true. Your son's not gonna have an hour's worth of, okay, super challenging content that only 5% of the country typically answers correctly. So it allows us to like hone in on a score more efficiently and turn a test that's three plus hours into a test that's a little over two hours. And College Board isn't dumb. I mean, they're thinking between putting it on computer and making it considerably shorter, they're going to attract more testers, right? People will be more interested in, in trying these things. But is the state standardized? Yeah, so that's the, that's the concern, right? Is that not everyone's taking the same test. And that's where this becomes much more scientific. Based on all the experimental data that College Board has, and based on having administered questions for years and years, they know exactly how hard every question is, and they're able to slot them in the right places on these exams. And so like, I have a full-time a full statistician, a PhD working for me now, who's doing that with our content. Um, so it's, it's absolutely doable, even if it feels more random. Can you talk the psychology of it, though? Because the thought of, I mean, in the math of it, too. So you do really well in the first module, and then you get right into the higher difficulty one. How, do, how does that make it? Um, I know we're trying, the whole point is to get the highest score, but for the same student who potentially would be having just the stress and anxiety of testing, continues to get hammered with questions without ever experiencing the easier questions that feel rote, that, that to me feels like it would have a bigger impact. Right? Yeah, so this, and so this is, this is where test prep will, will um, cover that. In terms of like the actual math content on the paper and digital tests, the differences are pretty minor, whatever, it's kind of a shrug. But yeah, the strategy of it is definitely different and the experience is different, you're right. And most of us grew up this way. Most of us remember taking tests where like the first 10 or 15 or 20 minutes were really like a warm up, right? And even on your worst day, they actually helped you get the butterflies out of your stomach because you're, you're, you're gonna answer them correctly. Whereas here, we have to tell the guys, look, you need to be fairly sharp by the time you start this test because we know you need to get X number of questions right to land yourself into, into the module you need to be in. And again, it's not that every question is of moderate difficulty. There will be a few easy ones um, part, as part of the equation, but the, per, the overwhelming majority of them will be in the medium range. So if you don't do well, though, you get into this category, can you ever make it up? Okay. Great question. So if you land, in the, if you land, if you land here, can you get an 800 in there? No, you cannot. Um, I just put estimations here. In most cases, you can, you'll be able to get up to 600, maybe even up to 650. You can still earn a very competitive math score. And by the way, you can do worse in this module than 650 or 600 as well. But 
to get the top, tippy top scores, you, you do need to land here, but to be candid, the students who are aiming to get 700, 750, or 800 are going to get here, even, even without so, thinking so about it. So then this is the test, and this is the makeup. <laughs> So, Essentially. So, yeah, I mean, what this will also help us do in our, in our courses is we always divide students up according to their scores and their strengths, and we don't make a big deal out of that, but that's something we do. But we'll be doing that in a very fine way so that we're making sure we're covering the right material. But, there will, but to kind of get to your point, many of the guys who come in Scoring in the middle range, these are going to be students we're spending our time getting them from here to there. And that, that already will give them the opportunity to make a 100 point jump just from that. Yeah? It's like psychologically, because I've done tests like this, and when I know I'm getting hard questions, I'm like, oh, I know I'm doing well because I'm getting hard questions. So if you're getting an easier question, you're like, oh, crap, I screwed up the first section. <laughs> <laughs> I think the good, the good part about this testing is that it's not question by question adaptive, because I agree, when it's every question getting harder or not, you can really do a number on yourself. Yeah. Like, that was easy, ugh, okay? Um, here, there's literally only one moment when that switchover takes place, and, and to be candid, if your son is preparing on his own well with a tutor in a class like mine, in, in any number of these ways, He's going to know very quickly whether he landed in the harder module, and then it's a non thought. Yeah. Um, there's another, yeah, and then I'll get you. And if he doesn't land, if, if that higher difficulty one, I don't like it. You should be already kind of okay again, you should have known. Well, keep in mind, you can still score up to 1300 or so in the easier module, which. <laughs> it's a tough crowd. <laughs> Of course, and you can super score taking it over multiple test dates, um, and most of our students will take it two or three times. Yeah, and many will will start on paper, right? Yep. Um, does each question carry the same weight? I mean, in other words, if I have two points, okay, right? So one round they are higher difficulty, another lower difficulty. Lower difficulty that every single question, right? The higher difficulty, he got you know less than half, right? Which student is better off? Yeah, it it depends on it depends on the exam and the placement of the question. But you're getting at it. There is a point of equality between the two. Not every question is worth exactly the same number of points. That's because the test is written with be, with something called item response theory behind it, which is exactly what you're getting at. Which is that di different questions will have slightly different weights. Um, to be candid with you, one of the things I'm not as thrilled about on the digital side is that the experience for the guys is a little more of a black box. You take the test, you don't see the questions after the fact for the real thing, and a score just magically appears. Um, and so, and this is part of it. This is part of what adds to the to sort of the mystery of it is the item response theory. Now, I want to, I want to point out some of the Similarities and differences here. Yes, I'm sorry. Quick question. You, you can never go back, right? Once you answer it, it's, it's gone. No, you can go back. Hold on. So, because the test is section adaptive and not question adaptive, you're going to do a whole section together. So, if, for example, a verbal section will have 27 questions in it. Students can just like very methodically work from 1 to 27 the way you'd expect, or they can do the test backwards, or they can flag a question that they want to revisit and look at later. So I think in that regard, it's a, a kind of a similar experience for the guys. Over those 32 to 35 minutes, they can bounce around a section as they would on paper. So that's kind of nice. All right. You're really not that tough. <laughs> um, now what you so you can get overwhelmed pretty quickly here, but I thought I'd spend a second 
just covering the most important sort of differences between the digital and paper exams. First, SAT versus SAT. So the digital test, as mentioned, is going to be adaptive, and the paper test remains static. Okay? What that really turns into is a length game. The paper test is about one and a half times as long as the digital test. It's about an hour longer. And it has about one and a half times as many questions, because it has those warm-up easier ones, right? Um, one and a half times more questions than the digital. And as mentioned, both tests are to be scored on the 1600 point scale, and scores are meant to perfectly equate, okay? Um, there are some content differences I'll point out later, but those are sort of the big picture differences. I think when you compare the digital SAT to the paper ACT, there, there's slightly bigger discrepancies. Um, for starters, the paper S ACT has an optional 40-minute essay tacked on to the end of it, okay? The guys do not, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we really don't need the guys to write that essay. Um, these essays used to be recommended. They are now neither required nor recommended of pretty much any college in the country. As a matter of fact, the SAT dropped this essay requirement a couple of years ago. So that's, that's one difference that should disappear. The biggest content difference relates to science. The ACT has always had a separate dedicated science section. 40 questions, 35 minutes, a lot of charts and tables and graphs, um, a lot of um, dense language, and some data analysis. It's the section on which the guys typically have the most trouble before they're coached and before they start prepping, okay? The digital SAT, like the paper one, does not have that section at all, okay? But it does sprinkle the same sort of scientific reasoning questions throughout. So you'll still have to do data analysis and you'll still have to manipulate charts and tables and graphs. But it just won't be in one concentrated section, okay? All right. Third difference, the ACT tests more geometry and trig, okay? And that kind of makes sense. Students still learn this stuff in school. But the SAT, both paper and digital, have fewer topics, more Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. So the upshot being that the SAT feels like it tests narrower stuff in greater depth. Whereas the ACT, with more geometry and trig and miscellaneous subjects, is sort of more topics, more superficially. Okay. So on the content side, it's, it's mostly science and math that are the differences. But to, to, to be honest, I don't think there are any guys who are going to run to one test out of either like a love of science or a hatred of Pythagoras. Like, I think... <laughs> I got one line on it. Um, I, think, I think they're going to do it based on more subjective criteria, like how does it feel? What's it like? And, and that's actually an important thing. As you're navigating this, sorry, this is just my, my time. All right. As you're navigating this, I don't think like memorizing these charts is how students should be picking their, their poison. I think the, the best way is for them to try these tests, right? and really compare. In terms of the differences, the ACT has always been maybe a little bit easier, but way more difficult to finish. That's the big difference, okay? It requires you to work about one and a half times as quickly as an SAT does. And that difference, I think, is gonna be even more pronounced when we go digital. Because if you look at this, the ACT, is 215 questions in just under three hours. The SAT is 98 questions. So it's it's not gonna, there are not gonna be many guys who are like, sign me up for 215. <laughs> I'm in. Um, however, some of them may be more comfortable on paper, may be more comfortable with more easy questions, and may end up doing a touch better on the ACT. So I don't want you to eliminate that. 
But you can see that that part is going to be very different experience-wise. All right. A couple other differences between the tests. All right. So this should also bring back memories because <laughs> this is what reading comp has looked like forever. A long passage and maybe eight to nine to ten questions that relate to that story, right? The paper tests are still littered with these. It is often the guy's least favorite part of the exam because it takes the most concentration, arguably. The digital test is not going to have any long passages. This is the one big content difference. Instead, it's going to have many, many, many short passages. 54 of them, as a matter of fact. Okay, Passages that are 25 to 150 words long. Okay. Um, that ask students to do different types of skill work. Okay? At first blush, this seems easier, right? And easier for your attention span. But it does require that students read these passages more, much more closely, and it requires you to change gears a gazillion times, which for some students will not be difficult, for others will be more enervating. But I, I just think it's important you know that I also wanted to show you this slide because they will have some, some sort of helpful tools when they test. There's an annotate feature that'll allow them to highlight or, or underline text. There's a strike through feature that will allow them to eliminate implausible choices. And as they're testing, they'll also have access to scrap paper and pencil and pen. For me, as a dinosaur, the first time I did this, I wanted to, you know, jump out a window. Because like I, this felt so strange to be seeing the question here and doing stuff there. Um, I think for the guys, that transition will be almost instantaneous. Um, but it, it is a difference. In math, um, most of the content is unchanged. There's going to be slightly more um, graphing required. And as a result, the guys will be allowed to bring their own calculator in. And they'll also have access to a calculator um, on screen that is Desmo style, that allows them to graph functions immediately, which is a, a format they're familiar with. So they'll, they'll like that. Um, and then as I showed you, they'll also be able to bounce around the section. Okay. Right, you're quiet now. Now I'm concerned. <laughs> Well, we'll get some questions. You mentioned earlier that the uh, digital SAT is more adaptive. Would it be beneficial for my son to take a prep in the summer and I'm preparing for him to take the digital in the spring? So, yeah, so let's get back to the, the timing, right? So, <clears throat> if your son starts prepping in the summer, I do think it would be smart to test in the early fall when the material's fresh. That means paper. But if he ends up being in a place where later in the year he wants to do the digital, where that will be his second type of test, he should. And I, I can tell you, if he works with me, we will have digital practice testing and follow-up work that he'll be able to do to make that transition. Um, but I would not spend two to two and a half months of summertime on test prep and then not touch testing for six more months. I think that's a bad way. So then, if I understand you correctly, if the transition is to digital, why do you prepare for uh, well, paper SAT? So, so here's the thing. We've looked at charts and we're like, okay, who's going to be better at which test and which test confers an advantage on which type of student? In the end, I probably could have come here for 12 minutes instead of an hour and said, you know what? You want your son to prep when he has the time to do it and when he's willing to. For many of them, if, it's, if that's the summer, then he should take a test right at the end of the summer. Okay. If his summer is too busy, if he's traveling for half of it, if that's impossible, then yeah, do the prep later and you can do the digital test later if you'd like. I, that's how I feel because I think given so much content overlap, I think it's their schedule and level of motivation that should drive the timing decision the most. The, the goal is whether they do the paper test or the digital test or the SAT or the ACT. I think a year from now-ish, next May, June, 
you want to have, ideally, a score in your pocket that's either like your dream score, like it all worked out, or that's at least pretty darn representative of where you are. So that next May, June, when, when you all as a family are starting to visit colleges and make putting together a preliminary list, you can figure out to what degree these scores are going to be useful. Okay? Are the scores just not close to what the colleges are expecting? And so are we going to shield them? Or, or the opposite? And to be honest, if testing ends up being important for your son, if it's going to be an integral part of his application, there's a great chance he'll test one more time after 11th grade. Some of you may know this from having older kids go through. Oftentimes, students will test one last time at the very, very beginning of senior year, either on the SAT or the ACT front. So it's April of 10th grade. We're, we're like a year and a half from where this ends. So this is like the very beginning of the beginning. And one thing to keep in mind, as much as we think summer is often a good idea, if your son is really fighting the process, okay, we really don't want to drag him through test prep here when he may not be done until there. So you, you need to think about it seriously as a family in terms of what timing realistically makes sense. Um, if you noticed on the way in, I put the summer schedules down. I'll also put out a sample winter calendar just to give you a look at what classes would be like later in the year. So when thinking about when to do the test prep, does your approach to how you prepare the student change if they were to take your test prep this summer versus next fall winter, given the difference in the test style? Yes, so, okay, you're setting me up. All right, so this is, this is the, the summer calendar for the course we're running here at, at Gilman. And the main elements are that we, we lock up the guys for four hours on primarily Monday nights, okay? I do that purposely. We, we do it for a long period of time because we want to not only teach them the new content, we also want them to be practicing it in a time-structured place. In other words, we could do a two-hour class and give them two hours of homework. I'm just not confident that homework. I'm not going to finish that sentence. OK. I found this is a better approach. Um, in addition to the classes, we will give periodic practice tests every couple of weeks. The summer course will primarily target the paper SAT and paper ACT. And the practice tests will all be administered that way. All right. Um, because we expect everyone in the program to do something in the early fall on paper. If your son waits, okay, puts this off, um, then the, our preparation in the winter is going to look very similar. We're going to work for three and a half or four hours, okay, usually on weekends, okay. The classes will be organized the same way, small groups where they're placed by their scores and their strengths. And we'll give practice tests every couple of Saturdays. But the big difference is all of those practice exams will be administered digitally. And yeah, some of the work we're doing on the Sundays will be reflective of the new tests, like shorter reading passages, not longer ones. So there are, there are differences. Um, if your son starts in the summer, we will have a refresher add-on, a booster, to transition to the digital. But we're not going to make him do this also. Um, we'll, we'll have him do something much, much shorter. Uh, but in either case, we're looking at two months of preparation with lots of practice testing integrated in there and a bunch of makeup and extra help hours. So that's, that's our plan. Actually, I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, can non-Gilman students sign up for the Gilman class? Yes. I mean, the Gilman guys have the home court advantage, and they're definitely a plurality of the students in the course, sometimes a majority, but no, it's, it's open to students from the area. So my second question is, what is the expected change in score from beginning before the class to after the class? Sure. So having done this for 25 years, I've got some good data. Um, our median improvement in the two-month course 
comes in at about 160 points, meaning half our students exceed that number and half of them are a little bit below there. And my expectation is that most students are gonna go up between 100 and 250 points in a couple of months. And what's interesting is, even though we've tutored several versions of the SAT, those improvements have been pretty static. We've been consistently getting those kinds of numbers. Obviously, there are all kinds of factors in play, like where they're starting out, how motivated they are, how much work they're willing to put in. But that's the expectation, is that they should make a pretty big jump pretty quickly. Um, how many times do you suggest they take the SAT? Can colleges see how many times they take the SAT? And then when you super score, could you super score with digital and written? Awesome question, okay. So I'll, I'll go out of order, but I'll get them all. So colleges will only see the scores that you send them, okay? Not necessarily every test that you've, that you've taken, all right? If you took the SAT twice, and one day was just rough for you, and the other day was way better, almost certainly you would only send that stronger day's numbers off to the school, okay? But your question is, what happens if you have kind of a combination? Maybe one day you ace the verbal, and the other day you do really well in the math. Well, in that case, you would send both days worth of scores, and colleges will typically do something called super score, where they will literally just extract that higher verbal and that higher math, and they will generate that combination number. Okay? That's become the standard in American institutions that are using these numbers. Okay. The question is, will colleges do this same super scoring across paper and digital? And they're not, they haven't made that decision yet. Based on my, my suspicions, okay, based on the fact that scores are going to equate, I believe many will. I also think it's a way for colleges to be as encouraging of testing as they can for students. So don't quote me on that, and we'll know much more in the coming months. Um, but my guess is that, um, that yes, that, that they will super score. And even if the school didn't super score, if I did really well on one part on one day and another part on the other, I would send both and, and make them digest that material. And they will see both. So they'll see the part that you don't want to show them as well. And, and yeah, you're not going to usually be able to, do, to shield that. And how many times do you suggest? Oh, and I forgot. I did miss that. Sorry. So... <laughs> Usually I'd say, and I think Matt, you, you share this, I, most students who are serious about testing will test two or three total times. Um, in my experience, it's usually twice in 11th grade or so, and then maybe a third time later on. But everyone's path is different. Um, what's nice is when we work with students and we have all this practice data, if we see the student blew away their practice exams, we can confidently tell them to stop. <laughs> sooner rather than later. So some people will only test one time, but two to three is probably a smart way to think about it. Is there one of these times that the statistically yields better results? So I, I'm often asked that, like, tell me for, for real, is the March <laughs> test the easy one? Not easy, but just they learn more, so, they're, they're more mature, they're right. more Totally right, I was, I was teasing. So, while no one month confers an advantage over another month, okay, um, there's definitely a developmental piece to this, okay? The older the guys are, okay, the better they generally will do. But that, that's not on like a two month basis. That's like when you're looking at a year. So if you took the test at the beginning of 11th grade, okay, and you did some refresher work, there's a really good chance a full year later you'll see a higher score. Um, but I would, I would mostly time the testing based on when they've prepared, not based on birthday. Um, but you're, you're totally onto something. Like senior scores often go up even when the kids don't practice as much as I'd like. And um, to, does, does anyone ever take the summer prep course? Do you offer a fall prep course or it starts in We do. Period? You do, because I'm looking at like, well, gosh, if he doesn't doesn't go prepare for the August SAT, but you wouldn't recommend doing the summer course and then doing the November SAT because that would be too far away yeah. from his prep time. So that's just too, too far of a gap. 
So yeah, we we actually run fall courses. I just didn't want to. I was trying. So we'll be back here in the fall. We can do refresher work then as well. Um, unless he really had a rough time in the summer the first time through, I'd still want him to get his first sitting in. But we could totally get the second sitting in in November or December with some some help in between. Yeah. Yeah. Totally got it. Say if I take the first pass, okay, a nice four average for my dream song. Yes. Say if you can. Is it worthwhile for me to prepare two more months to get higher, like say 15, 80, or perfect? So will that help me? Or it doesn't matter. It's just incremental, incremental marginal improvement. I, I think it really depends on um, what we think the student's testing potential is. <laughs> If, if that first set of scores, in our opinion, was close to the maximum we were expecting, then it may be time to just stop and spend your, spend your time on better things. Um, if we think your son has 50 to 100 more points in him, based on practice work, based on his, his, his own practice time, then it may be worth an extra sitting. But these are, these are like very individualized decisions. Um, because there's a balance. We want them to maximize their score, but we don't want this to take over, over their academic life. Let me take a few more questions, and I promise I'll stop. Yeah? Would you recommend sort of taking my son back? Because always myself takes uh, all the sets that he did the first year, and he does OK. But he wants to do it three times. And the next one in November is very busy with December, but then the next next one will be in March digital. So that's very tricky, right? Yeah. So I mean, ge generically, if he did nice nicely in August, but wanted to get a second sitting in, I I would probably delicately try try to have him take the second test this way, which is familiar. Um, on the other hand, if we think he maxed out in August, we don't think he'd do better than that. Then I might say, you know what, for fun, if you want to do the digital in the spring and try it, you can. But this will work for him. You could have cut me off earlier. But, yeah. So, but I guess, I guess what I want you guys to know is, I mean, I, I know I've talked about my course, and, and I, I know a good number of students will do it. That's fine. But if I can be of support, you, you do not need to like take my classes to give me a call and reach out. I will be happy during this year of transition to give you guys whatever guidance I can. But as you, as you see, it really will be a case-by-case -case kind of thing. I just think the, the place you guys can all start is when can he realistically dedicate the time to doing the study? And, and I think once you figure that out, you, you start to be able to make the testing choices. I'll put... I'm gonna, I'll put some handouts over there that include my contact info, but just so you have a way of, of reaching out to me. We'll share the slides too. Uh, perfect, yeah, so if you share the slides, that's even easier. Well, thank you, Phil. I think you can see why we um, are so grateful for our partnership and this is no more than now during this time of transition, so. This was supposed to make you feel better, not worse, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we pulled that off. But thank you so much. Um.